I also put yes to your daughter, Frank, um, getting involved in that way. <laughs> yeah. um, to everyone who is joining us from the various places, time zones, um, possibly even tomorrow, if you're far enough over an ocean, um, on behalf of everyone at Elliott Bay Book Company, along with my colleague, Karen, we are here on Duwamish land in the city of Seattle. And we are delighted to be presenting this evening's program, um, which helps celebrate the publication of poet and prose writer, Garrett Hongo's uh, long awaited um, and much anticipated memoir, The Perfect Sound, the great subtitle of memoir in stereo, um, because this is a book that has a lot about sound. I'm gonna say less than I might usually, and that, except I will say that Garrett's one of the writers who's had the longest history with us starting in the 1980s when we were just starting doing these and um, that were, you know, I, I've had some things I had, might've said, except that you're gonna hear, we're going to hear far more informed and closer to the source um, uh, introduction to Garrett as well as, uh, the, as the evening goes along conversation with Garrett in, in the person of Frank Abe, who is known to many of us here in various ways, certainly years as a, a, a highly acclaimed broadcast journalist and um, other media related presences he's had, but in, in more recent years has really taken on a very significant role um, with books. Um, he's a co-author of the extraordinary book published, I think last year, all these time years are getting weirdly compressed. Um, we hereby refuse uh, published locally by Chin Music Press, which um, Karen, of course, as the evening goes along, we'll be putting um, links to both Garrett's book and to Frank's. Um, we hereby refuse is, is um, out of stock because of the whole paper printing and all that, but it is available at the Wing Luke Museum. Wing Luke um, Museum co-presented, co-published it with uh, Chin Music, and so they do have copies. Um, Frank also um, did marvelous and important, significant work with um, the biography of, of sort of life and work of John Okada, the subtitle, the title is John Okada, the life and rediscovered work of the author of No No Boy that University of Washington Press has published. He also um, made the um, award-winning doc PBS documentary, Conscience and the Constitution, which uh, is on the um, Heart Mountain organized uh, internment camp resistance. Um, in Wyoming. He's been doing this work, all sorts of other important work behind the scenes. Um, there's an article and uh, Karen will probably run a link to it that just came out about Frank's role in the first um, Day of Remembrance um, uh, work done in 1978. So Frank, um, and, and that, that even brought up another part of his life as a merchant marine worker. Um, but he and Garrett have a long history that goes back to the 70s. And um, so it's a great pleasure to have them both doing this. Garrett, I will say, uh, Frank may get into this kind of thing in the biography of what he introduces Garrett, but uh, Garrett's also um, the author of poetry collections, Yellow Light, um, uh, or the Open, oh no, the, the River of Heaven, which is the book I think he first came up for in the eighties. Um, and um, he was here at, for Coral Road in 2011. Um, he's also the author of the Mirror Diary, a book of selected essays from his um, University of Michigan Press, which is also where I think um, Garrett did his undergraduate work way back in the day. Um, and he, Garrett is actually on the East Coast. He's not down in Eugene, whereas normally um, he would be coming from um, to, to Seattle. But um, I will um, remove myself, Karen will put, the information on and other information that comes up in the chat as we go, we hope you'll put questions uh, because you're, you're going to get a lot of information on poets, on music, on sound um, as these two go along and, and other things as they come up. Frank will take those questions and work them into the conversation. I will just come back at the very end to, to um, send this off into the night, but it's a the only thing we're missing here is being in the same room as these two would be something to behold together. So um, on that note, we thank all of you again for being with us and ask you to please join in giving good virtual attention and applause to Garrett Hongo and Frank Abe. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, thank you, Rick. And thanks everyone uh, for joining us. Uh, Donna, Sharon, all, all of you who are, have already joined us. Uh, I want everyone to know that, and Rick, you know, I, I owe my life here in Seattle to our guest tonight. Uh, I was a struggling actor in San Francisco when I got a phone call from some madman up in Seattle telling me about a new play he'd written called Nisei Bar and Grill. So he's looking for actors to come audition for the role of the Sansei Kid, and he proceeds to 
read me this monologue from the script where the kid brags about his hometown of Gardena, California as, as the Buddha head capital of the world or uh, the pure land of the Western paradise, baby. And, and even then, all, all over the phone line, you could just tell this guy was the real thing, a, a new and authentic voice in Asian American theater. So I hitchhiked up, I got the part, and I never left. And that was 1976. Uh, since then, Garrett's been a frequent guest of Elliott Bay, as, as Rick said. You know him as a poet and a wise soul, as, as Rick said, from River of Heaven, the Lamont Poetry Selection of 87, uh, Volcano, his memoir of Hawaii, and now uh, The Perfect Sound, uh, a really stunning new autobiography in stereo from Pantheon. So Garrett, welcome. Thank you for introducing me to this great city of Seattle, now my, my home. So the perfect sound has that uh, subtitle, a memoir in stereo, and the book seems to have three narrative threads. W what are they? Well, <clears throat> one is um, my having tried my, my, my re-entry into hi-fi, um, coming back from Europe in 2005, having heard opera at La Scala, and then wanting to create a stereo system in Eugene, Oregon, to reproduce that. It's about my quest, a sort of audio quest, to create a hi-fi system that could first A, play opera, but then everything else, you know, orchestral, jazz, uh, classic rock, even my father's hotel music. The third line is, a narrative line, is my involvement with music since I was a kid in Hawaii, um, in the cane fields, um, being introduced to big band music, watching the Jackie Gleason show when I was five years old. And on from there, um, through adolescence in LA, uh, listening to doo-wop and then Joni Mitchell and, you know, acid rock like everybody else and uh, jazz, particularly John Coltrane and Miles Davis and mm -hmm. Charles Mendes. And then uh, even temple music when I was in Japan for a year after I graduated from college. Um, the final line is about the birth of audio or the quest of audio itself from acoustic amplification with uh, the megaphone and the lyre and the Greek amphitheater all the way to the electronic amplification and recording um, in the late 19th century. I mean, from the early 20th century till now, you know, you can look at stereo or you can look at audio as sort of having four major eras. The uh, analog era where discs were in size with uh, the reproduction of sound waves, um, you know, this is Edison's 1012 phonograph, to then the beginning of the electronic age when Western Electric developed the microphone and speakers that could, you know, reenact what the microphone was doing. So there was an electronic age. Then there came um, a sort of uh, uh, what they called the magnetic age after 1945, when the allies brought German tape recorders over and they were able to make analog tape, you know, on magnetic tape. And that went all the way until 1975, when we entered the digital area, era with CDs and then ultimately computer files. We're basically in the digital era, era now. So I, I, don't, I take audio up until 1975. That okay. For the digital, we're going to have to wait for another book. Okay. Well, I mean, since we're talking about digital and audio, I mean, uh, what is your, is there really a difference to, for you with, between uh, analog sound and, and the, the, the ones and zeros of digital sound? You know, to a lot of us, it, it's, it's hard to tell. Well, you know, there's a lot of excellent equipment now to reproduce uh -oh, computer files into analog sound and the, uh, very expensive and specialized equipment that can cost thousands and thousands of dollars. And I'm told that that sound is pretty good. But it's cheaper, frankly, just to play analog off of vinyl records and get yourself a good phonograph, a stylus or cartridge and uh, a tube amplification system. And mm, I prefer that sound. Uh, okay. It's not having to be transferred from the digital uh, domain into analog sound. It's already it's already in analog, and so um, there's just one less transfer or handoff or one less mechanism that the sound has to come through to become real. 
So I, I like analog. As you can see, this is a screen of, of my uh, my stereo system. I do have a CD or an SA CD player in there, but I also have a kind of a magnificent turntable with uh, all the trimmings, as it were. Yeah, well, the, the thing about your book, I, I have to say what a pleasure it is to read it. Yeah, at first, I, I thought it was a departure for you, uh, kind of going off into this audiophile uh, sphere, but and it, you know, it wasn't a book of poetry like we're accustomed to hearing from you. But upon reading it, you know, the language is so poetic and rich and personal, as personal as anything you've ever done before. Uh, and so maybe you can just read to us, perhaps, Garrett, for, from uh, the early parts uh, yeah. where you talk about your relationship with the music that you, that you grew up with. Well, I can read, um, let me read the beginning pages of the book and then go into a, a passage about specific music. Shall I do that? Yes. So this is the from the Preludio, and I use that title, taking it from La Traviata, and then I'll read uh, the beginning paragraphs of the chapter, the first chapter called The Perfect Sound. From here in my stereo room, in my day basement, 10 steps down from my entry hallway, much can seem perfect if I close my eyes and just listen. I've all my gear arranged in front of me across the immaculate midnight blue Chinese carpet and against the acoustic panel wall opposite where I sit in my leather club chair, an acquisition from Pottery Barn during my middle age bachelor days. So much born of savings and sacrifice, but I hardly care since the sound here is so gorgeous it lifts me out of things into a pure fabric of wonderment, adrift amidst all the sublime welter of notes. I start with piano music in the morning, Mozart or Beethoven concertos, performed by the likes of Alfred Brendel or Claudio Arau. Their right hand runs so liquidness across the keyboard, it's as though a clear water of crystalline singing were running over a stream bed of orchestral accompaniment. I glance at the gleaming enameling on my speakers, brows high piano black towers that mirror the inset ceilings when I switch them on. And I begin to want to flutter my hands like seabirds, barely aloft over a dance line of shore break waves and indulge myself in this rapturous sequestration with music all around me. That's the preludio. And here's from the first chapter. I had been a casual lover of music for the longest time during my adult life when a lucky accident happened. Some 15 years ago, the CD changer in my stereo micro system suddenly broke down and I wrote a friend of mine, a former surfer turned English professor in Southern California, whom I knew to be an audiophile asking for advice about getting a new CD changer to replace it. I'd just come back from Italy where I heard opera performances at La Scala that were life-changing. They were so grand and beautiful. The magnificent first act of Puccini's La Boheme about struggling artists in 19th century Paris had completely changed my attitudes about poetry and music. I suddenly could not do without more of this remarkable art form in my life. To me, a compelling blend of grand music, romantic poetry, and high melodrama. But living in a small town in Oregon, I had no regular access to the grand halls of the American metropolis, let alone the Scala. What started out as merely a wish to hear La Boheme and La Traviata playing daily on my stereo in my living room has morphed into another passion not only for music and its great archive, but also for audio equipment and what each piece of it could do to bring me closer to what I thought I wanted to hear. That's nice. Well, um, you, you know, later in the book, you really go into uh, different artists that you've, you've enjoyed listening to. And then uh, there's one passage where you recall seeing um, Taj Mahal at Pomona yeah. College, uh, and and you describe it in such detail, in such vivid detail. I, uh, the, the, this, this, just the accuracy of memory and, and um, 
um, is just so strong. I, I wonder how, how, how do you do that, Garrett? <laughs> the, the, the power of memory seems so strong in, in your writing. I think that, uh, you know, as a poet, <clears throat> I've trained my memory. Uh, as an actor, you know this too, uh, you train yourself to remember sensual, sensuous memory. So you key on certain things and then because of that key, it leads to the rest, you know? So I can still remember the sound of Taj Mahal playing that resonator guitar in the student union at Pomona College. And uh, what is what he looked like, he looked like a, a linebacker with a big white hat with a red feather in it and it flipped back and forth. And um, I remember what he, what he was like. Um, and that song was uh, uh, Corina, you know? And um, later it'd be on his album, Natural Blues. And I don't know, I just, um, I seem to have that ability, but you know, uh, people might take issue. They might remember it differently than I, I suppose. Um, but uh, that's what I remember. I, I, I remember the sound of it and I remember the visuals. And uh, I remember Taj standing up and giving a speech when they're kind of cat calling him, telling him to play certain songs and he wouldn't do it. Right, play said, Karina, play Karina, Karina. <laughs> he, he, he said, don't be yelling at us. We come to school you in the blues. We come to give you our sore hearts so you can weep with us. And he was very stern, but eloquent. And I, I remember that, I remember that. Yeah, well, I mean, but this, this you know, connection to Taj Mahal, then uh, you take it into a visit to uh, Keb Mo, someone I'm not, I don't, I don't know, I don't know his music myself, but I mean, and then I was reading along and you're suddenly going to visit him in, in his home in, I guess, Tennessee or wherever. Well, Keb Mo and, and uh, Kevin Moore is his given name and Taj made an album together called Taj Mo about four years ago, was it? And um, there's videos of them playing Corina together. Um, and uh, I think the chapter starts with a recap of that video. And then I go into the story of having seen Taj perform live in 1969. Um, and it was also about the time that um, Keb Mo was getting introduced to the blues. He grew up in Compton, California, which is the town next to Gardena, you know. In fact, I went to high school with kids from Compton. And we have a, a couple of friends in common. That's how I got introduced to him. And, Oh, that's and I was wondering. Yeah, he was in L.A. and I was in France and we did a FaceTime and set up the interview. So I went out to visit him when I got to Nashville to do a reading at a, 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 a conference. So it just worked out. So I spent an afternoon with him, listened to him play and talk story. And, and uh, that's how that grew. You know, he's a, probably one of the best known blues artists around these days. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I follow you on Facebook, of course, and I, I saw that you you were visiting stereo manufacturers over the last couple of years and uh, vinyl record plants and lovingly kind of photographing and documenting your experiences there on Facebook. And I thought, man, Garrett's really going off on a thing, but I didn't realize now that you were, you were doing research for this book on, on that, on those visits. Yeah. I was in Prague to teach, um, you know, poetry to uh, a group of um, international and American students there few years ago, and I knew that there was a tube factory out there, a vacuum tube factory. So I peeled off after teaching one morning and I went and spent two afternoons of that tube factory taking a tour, taking notes, interviewing the chief engineer and getting the history of that plant and how they make these old vacuum tubes. Um, uh, and that's part of it, that's in the book too. And of course, while I was there, I, I, I don't think it's in the book, but I attended a performance of Mozart's Requiem at the Opera House where Mo Mozart premiered um, Don Giovanni, you know, this, the exact same Opera House, you know. And so there's a lot of things you can do in Europe when you're there. Uh, uh, when I was in France and Paris, I went to see Monet's garden as Giverny, you know, his, his Japanese garden. And then I just fell into this sort of wandering and taking advantage of certain travels. Um, when I, when I was in LA, that's when I went to a record factory, a vinyl factory. Um, and uh, I haven't done, this is actually the first trip I've taken in over two and a half years. So I haven't done any trips. When I was in 
Italy at a time or two, I would go and visit uh, audio manufacturers in Italy and, and interview them, you know. But, but Garrett, why? I mean, what, what, what drives you to, to want to do these things? Uh, like my friend Amadeo Shembri says, uh, the uh, designer of one of my two amplifiers, it's all about the sound because I found there are a few designers who create these machines, these audio machines to reproduce the music as close to the uh, impression of a live and bre event that I, I can get. Um, you know, I, you know, the sound in a Scala, for example, is quite striking. It's unforgettable and there's nothing like it um, in an opera hall in the United States. It's different. The, the halls here are too large. Um, you're too far away. It's very intimate in Europe. And it's almost like a personal event for your own life. If you go to the opera in um, La Scala or the, in Rome or, you know, go La Fenice in Venice. Um, <laughs> uh, the musicians are in your lap, you know, and the singers are right in your face. And it's so moving and so spectacular in art form. So to, to get the machines to reproduce that level of uh, presence takes a special kind of ear. You have to have the electronic and mathematic skills, but you also have to have that level of music so that you, your instrument that you create can capture the sort of presence of that event. And it's not easy. Um, if you only create something to measure well, it's, it's just not the same. You lose all the life, you know, you lose all the, the presence, the, 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 the living voice, as it were, mm -hmm. of whatever it is, the human voice or the violin or the oboe. Uh, it's very important to get it to sound like music. And it's not always the case when you buy a piece of stereo gear. Right. Hold that thought for a second. Uh, I want to tell the audience that, uh, you know, I see myself here more as a moderator to facilitate a conversation with between you and the viewers. So those of you who are watching, please go ahead and drop your questions for Garrett into the chat. I can see them. I can just pull them up and grab them and, and ask them of Garrett. But in terms of the uh, wanting to get the quality of sound, um, one, you know, what I like about also in the book is you, you link the desire for um, building good systems to your personal relationship with your father and how he would build uh, stereos from Heath kits. And you have this wonderful, uh, you know, description of passage of Heath kits. And uh, I mean, I, I remember building Heath kits myself as a kid in, in high school electronics. Well, you, um, you did it then. I mean, you have that. Um, yeah. Well, let me just read you a paragraph about that then. Let's see, here it is near the beginning of the book. As my obsession grew, I discovered there was something else behind it that was driving me a search to reconnect with my father who passed away over 35 years ago when he was 58 and I just 32. I got involved with using vacuum tubes for stereo accidentally. When sometime after I acquired a CD player, I ended up buying the very one that my surfer professor friend happened to be getting rid of. I saw a photo of a new Dutch designed Chinese built amplifier that was visually crafted along retro lines. It reminded me of my father's equipment and willfully, I wanted that amp to be the one that suited my system. In the end, I bought the amp and rebuilt my system around it, learning how to shift the character of the equipment sound by changing its tubes, getting closer and closer to an early 1960s style of fidelity, which then let go a flood of memories of my father building his own equipment, testing it, swapping tubes, asking me to listen for him, tell him what the music was like. My father um, did the same thing as you, Frank. He built first a Heath kit amplifier and then a Dyna kit. And then I think something he may have gotten from a high fang magazine from Schematics. Um, he got speakers from Fedco, but his hearing was failing him. And he couldn't tell the little tinkerings that he was doing. He couldn't tell how they were affecting the character of the sound. So he would ask me at the age of 10 and 11 to describe to him what his little tinkering did to change the sound. 
So I would listen very carefully to the Harry James music, the Tommy Dorsey, the Glenn Miller, the Arthur Lyman, the Alfred Apaka music he'd play, and try to translate what I heard into Hawaiian pidgin English so he could understand it. His language was only Hawaiian pidgin. So um, I think that was the, the beginning of my lessons in trying to describe sound. And it was an acuity I revivified when I came back to try to create my own system. And then this, these memories of my father doing that in the evenings just flooded back to me. And then as an adult, it, I just realized, you know, he was doing this to listen to his music for the last time before his hearing totally shut off. And it just killed me. I mean, I thought, what a thing to do. What a noble thing, what a peaceful thing. And here he was having had his hearing damaged because of the war, you know. So I, I, I just loved him even more because of that. Wow. Um, that's, so you that's could wrong. see the book is a, a pursuit also of my father um, and a kind of reproduction of his experience, but also a fulfillment in a way of, of kind of his um, spiritual and existential legacy. I'm living in the sound that he couldn't live in. One of the qualities of your of your book is that you can I, I I'm just opening it up to any page, you know, and you can just read this wonderful these wonderful stories uh, from across your your life, uh, and and some of these things you've covered before in other you know other like volcano and, and roof of heaven, but uh, it, it feels like you've you've gone deeper into your your life and experience with with this book. Is that, is that, is that am I right in reading it that way? Well, you know, I used my the chronicle of my involvement with music as a way to track. And that's why there's the joke. It's a memoir in stereo. I use the music and my memory of music as jump jumping off points to to remember all these other things that I was involved with at the time. So, you know, I mean, do up means being a, a early adolescent, learning about girls. Joni Mitchell means my first girlfriend. You know. Uh, John Coltrane means just before I jumped off to Japan uh, and I was reading Walt Whitman and then um, Marvin Gaye means my first graduate poetry teacher Robert Hayden, the great poet Robert Hayden, teaching me John Keats, you know, when I was in Ann Arbor. And um, I have a chapter about Etheridge Knight, the great poet. Um, he taught me about hog calling, fuel howlers and um, the blues, you know. I think there's the chapter about Keb Mo comes right after the chapter about Etheridge Knight in the book. Um, yeah, I do talk about a lot of different parts of, of what I've gone through. And, 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 and like I say, music is sort of um, the twin of all, the, all these experiences. It, it's, it's, it's not so much nostalgia as people might want to think about it. It's sort of a mnemonic device, like a memory palace, you know? So like I say, if I remember Taj, I can remember that whole scene and I, it's still alive for me in a, as an event and I can narrate it. Um, you know, Wild Horses by the Stones reminds me of a girlfriend I had when I was in Japan and um, um, the adventures and hijinks that we had together there. Meeting Alan Lau for one thing, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Alan, uh, Grace uh, Toy out in, in New Jersey asks, um, uh, were your, well, were, were your plays ever published and still available for sale anywhere? But really, it's just the one play, right? Yeah, um, I'm still not gone back to finish that play. I never did finish it. Um, the manuscript is in the Harvard Yenching Library, and that's about it. Um, I promised Frank that I go back and finish it, though. So maybe someday. Promised me or Frank Chin? I promised you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Frank Chin was a, was the director of, of the play. I, I'd forgotten about that in 1976 in the summer. Uh, and speaking of Alan Lau, Grace also asks um, about, uh, please share how music influenced the Buddha Bandits on Highway 99, that early collaboration for Buddha Head Press between you and Alan and Los Ninata. Well, uh, the idea I think might have been Alan's. I'm not sure whose it was. We should do a book together. This is this is a book cover. Buddha Bandits. And, 
Callum's drawing? I envision the poetry that would go along with the music. Um, and I think we did our first concert in Long Beach State. And uh, we were using pieces of my brother's band, my brother, the, the blues guitarist, his band that was called Small Fry uh, and pieces of Hiroshima, uh, the, the musician from Hiroshima. And we composed a special um, sort of jazz suite. I think it was largely composed by Alan Furtani, a flute sax player, to accompany Alan's poem, The Journey. And for mine, we just did riffs. It, it wasn't pleasing or satisfying to me. But when we did Buddha Bandits in Seattle twice, um, we worked with Marcus Tsutakawa, a great composer and bass player. And we worked out, um, in a way, charts to accompany my poem called Cruising 99. And it was a combination of jazz standards that went along with some improvisation and uh, a through line of the idea of, of an itinerary, a movement through space, a travel log, but also a kind of um, jazz suite. And that worked out very well. Um, I think there are a couple of standards like body and soul, and um, I don't remember what else. And then one of the vamps we used, we borrowed from John Coltrane's Equinox. Uh, and that worked very well as well. Um, and I write about that poem in um, that poem, Freudian Slip, that song in, in the book as, as a kind of twin to Walt Whitman's starting from Pamanak. Um, so we, we actually composed music to the poems that we did. Uh, I don't remember what Lawson did. He didn't spend a lot of time rehearsing with us. So we just sort of uh, faked it. I think every time <laughs> Lawson took the stage. Um, but uh, Alan's piece and mine were composed. Yeah, yeah he did a uh, right on 99, a note on the music, and I told you so. Yeah. And, and uh, we were discussing before we went on the air here that uh, uh, you actually might have a recording, uh, an audio recording in your garage somewhere that we might be able to uh, recover someday. So I hope we can hope My high school it. classmate, Dwayne Ibarra, produced the show in Long Beach. And uh, he also went on to become the... Uh, a culture director of the Japanese American Cultural Center in LA. And uh, he, sadly, he passed away quite young, but he made the video. And I uh, hear people now um, are looking to try to restore it and, and archive it uh, at Visual Communications. Someone, someday, maybe. Yeah. Um, I wish I'd put those gigs in the book, but I didn't. Um, so someone, Karen, I guess, asked me what's not in the book. The Buddha Bandits is not in the perfect sound, alas. But there are other <laughs> Japanese American and Asian American artists who are. I was going to get to that, Garrett, because you, you pick up the story after you left Seattle in 78, went down to UC Irvine for your, your writing program, which is when I, kind of, I lost track of you after that. But uh, I remember that, that you was were hired. Perfect... Oh, was it? Oh, thanks a lot, buddy. <laughs> um, I think we had we we did we did about falling out at the time, as I recall. So no, I, was, I don't remember that. Oh, I well, we'll, we'll talk later. <laughs> um, uh, that was when I went off to do the Merchant Marine thing. Actually, um, you uh, write write about you said Irvine and also hanging out uh, at the home of someone's home in, in L.A. and and it was Wakako. Wakako. Oh, Wakako's home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, by special request, first tell us about Wakako Yamauchi. And uh, she was kind of a mentor to, to you, uh, as we she all was, know. She was. Yeah. Um, I call her my kumu mele, my master of song. Um, when I think we might have met in 1975, before I came to Seattle. And I lived only about a block from her. Right. And um, I was working for the Department of Water and Power. And I knew she lived in Gardena. I looked her up. I called her. And she invited me to breakfast. And we proceeded to talk for almost the whole day after that. She would tell me stories about what the first generation and second generation were like, um, spiritually, emotionally, not just you know, material facts. And she talked about um, life before the internment, and then what it was like in camp. She was in Roar, oh, excuse me, post in Arizona, where she uh, was pals with Isai Yamamoto, and. Um, 
she told me lots of stories about the itinerant workers before World War II and after Japanese Americans. And uh, I guess orally transmitted the tradition to me and, and brought me into the feeling of uh, descent, as it were, of that which I felt was nowhere else present in my life, certainly wasn't given in history books and both Im the immigration from Hawaii and the war were such silencing forces in this upon the psyches of Japanese Americans. We third generation people hardly knew at all what our parents were like or what their feelings were, what our grandparents were like and what their feelings were. Wakako told me about all those things, uh, not just by, by telling me stories. And, um, you know, the way that um, Ernest Gaines' aunts told him stories about uh, Mississippi, you know, um, before desegregation. And uh, she was sort of my uh, shaman, right? And she just took me in and she'd even feed me and uh, she even put me up uh, in her home. And uh, I guess I became a deshi, a disciple of hers. And it was a big moment in my life to have a teacher like that, to have a um, sponsor like that. And I owe her a lot. Um, oh, and, and you you honor her in, in the book. By, there's several pages about Wakako further uh, in, in your book. Uh, you say this is around the time she was writing And the Soul Shall Dance, her play. Yes, which... you know, the thing about Wakako was she would also sing. What? When she would remember the stories and the people, she would sing those old Japanese songs, you know, the Ryokoka and the Enka and the Minyo. She would sing them and then she would tell the story. Oh. And then when she talked about the Nisei, she would sing swing tunes, like don't sit under the apple tree with anyone else but me. And um, I can't remember, but, you know, she would sing these 40s sort of pop songs and talk about the dances uh, at uh, at uh, Poston that the Nisei would put on. So it, I kind of keyed on that. And the title and the Soul, Chant, Soul Dance comes from a, a Japanese drinking song, uh, sake song, you know, hmm. uh, Kokoro ga Odoru. And she would sing it for me and, and then tell the story of that dancer she met when she was eight or nine or 10 in the hmm. desert in California. Fantastic. Um, it, it must have been quite a privilege for you then to produce And the Soul Shall Dance here at the Ethnocultural Theater at the UW. Uh, in yeah, it was, it was great. I mean, uh, that's, I, I recruited Stephen Sumita to play the lead and Amy Hill to play the daughter, his daughter, and Doug Samashima, um, a, a DJ in Seattle, played one of the farmers. Um, Nora Marr played one of the daughters, you know. My, my sister-in-law now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, those were the days. Yeah, yeah. Well, see, I, I should tell the audience that the, when Garrett came to Seattle, it was called the Asian Multimedia Center or the Theatrical Ensemble of Asians. And when Garrett was brought in as a fundraiser and a very talented fundraiser, he raised a lot of money uh, for the Asian Multimedia Center and changed the name of the group to the, tell us the name of the group, Garrett. I called it the Asian Exclusion Act. Um, naming it after the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1988, and also thinking in terms of the anti-alien land law of 1924 that forbade Japanese from owning land. And yeah, I told David Maria, and I thought that was the, the best title, best name ever for an Asian American acting troupe. Unfortunately, folks in Seattle were not too comfortable with it, I guess. No, they didn't like it. Um, I remember the board saying that it was too aggressive or too, um, they felt that it was not the personality of the Asian community in Seattle. Yeah, well, but I think I said, I don't care about that personality. I want to create a new one, um, which was always my trouble with everybody. Uh, I sort of in insist on artistic independence, um, probably why I became a poet. I only work oh. with my own psyche and imagination. Right, you're in control uh, as opposed to yeah. being, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, picking up back on um, Wakako in, in talent shows and camps and stuff, that, that goes on to my, my next thought of 
the people you met at Wakako's house who had also performed in Camp Shibai, the, the talent shows. Yes, it was called Shibai Talent Shows. Yeah. 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 So so you you got to hung you in the book you described so vividly hanging out with Pat Suzuki and uh uh Jack Sue, right. whose real name was Goro Suzuki, right? They were elders, you know, it wasn't really at Wakako's house. It was at Momoko Iko's apartment in Hollywood. They okay. were doing um, read-throughs of a book, a play called Flowers and the Household Gods, or they were filming Gold Watch. I can't really remember, but I would, I would always be, it was always the ladies, the elder women who sponsored me, like Maxine Hongkingston, like Wakako, like Jeannie Houston and Momoko, who sort of took me under their wing. And those were sort of my, Asian American mentors. Momoko would invite me so I would meet and watch rehearsals. I would meet other Asian American artists. And I, I saw Jack and, and, and Pat perform, you know, after hours in Momoko's apartment. And uh, you want me to read that section? Would you, I want you to read that paragraph about Jack Sue because it's an example of just the accuracy of your description. I mean, I've never seen Jack Sue described Someone who doesn't know who, who he is will get who he is from your description of him. Well, Jack was, I think, best known for his comedy role on TV in a show called Barney Miller. I think he even won a Grammy for it. Um, and there's a video called You Don't Know Jack about Jack Sue, which is not bad. It's pretty good. Um, when I met him, ran into him, he was the guy who was in Flower Drum Song, the nightclub owner. In the in the movie Flower Drum Song, Sammy Fong. Yeah, and I didn't know his um, history in Oakland. But the myth was, maybe I tell it in this section. I don't know, so I'll keep it cool. See if the myth comes up in the. There's a sort of a, a apocryphal story about Jack that's more fable than than truth. He developed a, a kind of all American persona. His accent almost New Yorkerish perhaps fashioned after cinema gangsters. And his postures, whether sitting or standing, were languorous and slouchy, like an old hat or well-worn sofa. He was most comfortable, it seemed, in an easy chair in the corner of the apartment next to an open window, curtains periodically billowing behind him like the gigantic gills of a translucent carp. He'd light up a filter tip cigarette Po poise it like a corkscrew between his index and middle fingers, accept a sweating highball from the playwright and hold forth with a story, modulating his baritone voice in gentle tones, confident everyone was listening. Schlumpfy as a tall bag of hotel laundry, he must have been handsome when, when, he, when younger. He had the supple moves of an ex-athlete, which he was, hooded eyes, dyed eyebrows and hair, and an incredibly relaxed manner of speech that reminded me of Dean Martin, his vowels plosive, the syntax of his long sentences sashaying like a trombone's, his head cocked to one side in dismay or disbelief at what you might say, or held ready for a double take. The myth was that he changed his name from Goro Suzuki to Jack Sue so he could hide out in San Francisco Chinatown pretending he was Chinese. But that's not true. He actually went, was a, in internment, an internment camp. I forget which one. And he was the MC at all these Shibai. And he polished his routines by acting as the host for the variety shows, the Nisei variety shows, when they were all in camp. Wonderful. I mean, besides the story of the, you know, the inside story of, of those Hollywood people. Uh, it's just, the, again, the craft you have in, in, in the, the recall of the details of, of that moment of that person is just astonishing. And, and you get that through on every page of this book, it's there. Well, thank you, Frank. You're welcome. Um, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, one, okay, one quick question about Pat Suzuki, uh, uh, because, uh, uh, and we'll, we'll move on. Uh, but uh, Pat Suzuki, you describe her there as well. And uh, I never realized that how, how good of a singer she was, but you, you just you tell us um, really how, how talented she was. Well, she actually uh, polished her chops in Seattle. She sang in a Seattle nightclub for almost two years straight, I think, after um, World War II. And that's where um, 
the jazz circuit picked her up. She was in the original cast in the Flower Drum Song. She actually had the role that she was replaced by Nancy Kwan, right? The All-American mm -hmm. girl yeah. in there. But Pat got the part because she could sing like hell. Great jazz singer. In fact, you know, the version of How High the Moon that's often played in the movies, whatever movie it is, is Pat Suzuki's version. Got if it. you listen carefully, it's got Pat. It. Got it. Um, let's say, let's see. I sense the tension between uh, Jack and Pat Suzuki, the Japanese American jazz singer who was in that show too. I'm talking about Flower Drum Song, playing Linda Lowe, one of the female leads on Broadway. Her showstopper was the tune I enjoy being a girl, but few recall it as hers because she was replaced in the film by the non-singing though curvaceous Nancy Kwan. Today, the song seems parodic and is mainly performed by drag queens to hoots and squeals from audiences geared to camp and gender bending. It likely can't evolve much further than that. But Suzuki herself, a middle-aged woman when I met her, my boss, Pat Morita, uh, I was working for Pat Morita at the time uh, on his TV show. This is uh, uh, Pat Nobuyuki Morita, who by the way, gave me the best advice of my life. He said, kid, you should go back to poetry. You know why? You're not funny. <laughs> anyway, all right. Pat Morita called her cruelly, I thought, a washed up chick singer, was something of a chameleon short and petite when young and performing to big time audiences and on the hit television shows hosted by Lawrence Well, Jack Parr and Sinatra, she had thickened some, become matronly a figure yet possessed the pixie-ish face and quick cat-like moves of a veteran stage performer. She could curl up like a manx in the corner of a sofa, bat her eyes and accept a cold drink, staying silent while others told stories. Um, but she would sing. One time it was In My Solitude, the stately ballad by Duke Ellington, taken slow, sensitive to the hidden drama only traced by its lyrics. In my solitude, you haunt me. She sang it completely unlike the brassy show tune she'd been known for, emphasizing the loneliness of its theme, stretching the cooing long third vowel of solitude drawing it out with a light, glassy vibrato, cool as sheet ice. Her elocution reminded me of Ivy Anderson, maybe Ellington's finest singer. There was a theatricality to it, a powerful aura of poise and sophistication, even as she slimmed the note down to a breathless whisper at the end of a phrase. And when she sang, there's no one could be so sad in a following verse, she gave the briefly elongated A in the last word, a subtle, almost metallic sheen, as though from a muted trumpet. When she sang, I'm crazy, the A had a slight, initially emphatic jump to it, then lilted off in a long tailing decay, as though cigarette smoke from a detective in a film noir were being put to rest in a satin lined casket. Well, right, that- She I, had some I, pipes. Yeah, well, I, I feel like I, I was right there when, when I hear you read that. I mean, I, I think we all feel like, you know, we could share in that moment that, that you just remembered so vividly. So thank you for that. Uh, in, in My Solitude, I think was the caption or the subtitle for that section. Yes, and, right. Yeah, and I, I, I just realized that. And uh, I love how uh, you used lyrics from songs uh, for, you know, to, to kick off different sections. Uh, no one told me about her, baby, <laughs> love, right? It's my life. And my favorite was Kathy, I'm lost, which is just a phrase. Obscure. It's very obscure now, but to our generation, I hope that it struck a familiar key. It was a total trigger. Kathy, I'm lost, even though she, I know she was sleeping from uh, Simon and Garfunkel's uh, bookends, uh, yeah. uh, Amer America, right. Right. So, right. I mean, the absolute triggers. Uh, so uh, I want to pivot a little bit now to um, more of the audiophile uh, uh, 
aspect of the book. Uh, you talk about Michael Freemer, your, a friend of yours, you met Michael Freemer, who, who uh, you visited him, and he told you the story of how he, he fixed the turntable at the home oh, yeah. <laughs> of Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. And that's why I have my, my, my mug here uh, in memor commemoration of that. Uh, well, Michael was kind of um, on the outs. He was sort of like hustling, trying to make money doing this and that. He tried to do stand up and then he did advertising and then he did, um, I don't exactly know what, but he was in LA and he was friends with a guy who was the doctor or the psychiatrist who provided uh, Wilson with meds during the time of his, let's call it um, psychological um, wardship, right? And he goes to this place, I, I guess it was in Malibu or in the Hollywood Hills. And I'll, I'll just tell the story rather than read it. There's, a, there's a, an adult sized high chair in the middle of an empty room. And it's just very weird because there are all these cigarette burns on the, on the, on the, on the table and also cigarette butts on the floor. And on the other side, there's just a turntable on a, on a table. It's very, very like, like a decurical scene, you know, surreal and spooky. And the doctor goes off with the nurse and then he's left there. And uh, Brian Wilson wanders in, in a diaper. And he goes over to the turntable and he says, no one will fix it. No one will fix it. Why can't anybody fix it? He's talking about this turntable. Framer recognizes it absolutely for what it is. A dual, you know, 128 or something, you know, he knows the numeric designation. He knows the mechanics, the machinery. And he turns it over to see if it, it's frozen because that's the number one problem with these turntables. He just knows it. And he, he gets some grease and he, he works the mechanism and he fixes it. And then he turns it over, plugs it in, pushes the button and the turntable spins. And, 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 and Brian Wilson brings a record over, plays it and starts bobbing side to side. I can hear music and weeping. And uh, that's our Brian. Michael told me that story. I, I end the chapter about Michael with that story. Yeah. Well, uh, he's probably the number one audio reviewer in America. See, I didn't know that you were contributing uh, to these audiophile magazines all these years. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did it as a way to learn about equipment to teach myself how to listen to this machinery, trying to bring together what I had in my head as the sound I wanted and what the machine could do to tutor me about what it could provide. Because I knew so little about the mechanics of the machinery, the electronics and whatever, you know, all the things involved. And I, I, I took the assignments, you know, I, I didn't ask to do it. I, asked, I, got, I got asked to, to write about vacuum tubes at an audio show one time. And I said, great, I got a way to pay for it. And uh, I'll just, you know, blither away. And then right after I wrote that show report, three or four magazines asked me to write for them. And I said, oh, okay. Uh, I took the best offer that, and it happened to be an editor that knew me as a poet. And he was a great editor. He was editor of Soundstage then, Mark Mickelson. Um, and then after a couple of years, he moved along to another, his own magazine and I stayed with Soundstage. And I've been writing for them ever since, like 2009 or so. And review, and I also reviewed for the Absolute Sound for a while. Um, but you know, it's just too much to review. Too much. Besides, my other life was a poet and an academic. And yeah, to, and a uh, professor. Yeah. Much, uh, so I should tell people that what we're looking at behind you is a photograph of your your listening room in Eugene, Oregon. And I had the privilege of visiting you there just before the pandemic, actually. And uh, you played the you played smile for me. You, you had the, uh, the vinyl of elbow smile. And, and you said, uh, you know, pick your favorite track, Frank, and I'll play it for you. And, and you played it. And I, I got to tell you, I, I it was, sounded perfect. I felt like I was in the studio. But I, all, all I could think about was, I was worried you're, it was too loud. And your daughter was trying to study. <laughs> uh, she was about 13, then I guess. Um, yeah, she's a studious person. Um, but I stopped but playing at, at, at 9.30, 10 o'clock every night. Yeah, because we were there late. We were, we were late, late for dinner. Uh, so 
take us through, if you just real quickly, you, what's behind, well, you know, behind you, it's a picture, but. Well, you, the you, big you, black things are my uh, speakers. They're called a Skendo. Yeah, there's, it's spelled a Skendo, but they're very particular about how you pronounce it. Um, they're made in Germany, in Munich. And I actually searched the world for them because they're produced a long time ago, like 12, 15 years ago. And um, I had the smaller version of these speakers for a while, and they were magnificent, but they didn't have enough slam, what's called slam in audio, bass strength, you know, the lower register. They didn't pressurize the room, but they had those ribbon tweeters that you see. And I found a pair in Mumbai, a pair in Corsica, a pair at Istanbul. And the one in Istanbul turned out to be a pretty good deal. But then the pandemic hit and um, things became a little difficult, um, intricate as it were, not so much for the personality of the seller, just because of shipping and all kinds of other things. Sure. Then astonishingly, a pair showed up in Portland, Oregon, because I put an ad out. So I, I made it known through the audiophile community. I was searching for these and the guy sold them to me and brought them down in his own lift gate truck and set them up and in my system and there they are they're set up that way they're called a skin a skin no m's they're very and did you did you build the amplifier yourself no i can't build a thing myself the amplifier is a zandon 8100 8120 it's made in osaka by uh yasujiro yamada yamada san and the preamp is also made by zandon i think it's a 3100 um tube preamp a tube amplifier and the phono stage is a Zandon phono stage 120. The SA CD player is an esoteric um, K5X. Um, and it plays SA CDs and CDs. And also is a digital audio converter. I could use it with a streamer. There's also a streamer DAC in there made by Blue Sound. And I just use it sort of as a jukebox. But on top is a TW acoustic um, Raven AC1 turntable um, made near Munich uh, by a German um, manufacturer that I quite like. And um, I'm really happy with this system. It has a, a cartridge on it made in the Netherlands called Kiseki of all things, just a Japanese name. And then uh, on the other arm, I have two arms on it. I have a um, Miyajima Zero which is a monophonic uh, cartridge made in Japan. And um, the tone arm is made in Japan as well the, on the one side. And then the other one is made in Germany. It's mm -hmm. pretty like, high end, I suppose, you know? Well, yes, I, I, I still have a turntable myself, but uh, you, you, your system is amazing. The, the turntable is like a, like a stack of uh, pancakes, a black shellac pancakes. It is a, I've never seen a turntable right, that thick right. before. There's the base, there's the plinth, there's the platter. It's just, it goes on. It's all to, to make great sound and it does make good sound. The thing is I, I, I base it on, to me, some of the most difficult kind of music to reproduce, which is orchestral and operatic. Um, my opinion is this music is the most difficult to reproduce and, and also piano concerto with um, any kind of presence. And so, um, a system may play, you know, rock or jazz fine. You put that music on it, it just collapses. Um, so it's built to play that kind of music, but it'll, it will play anything. You put Wheels of Fire by Cream on it, Supernatural by Santana, it'll just kill, you know. I, I, I can attest to that from personal experience. Well, we're getting up to the top of the hour, Garrett, and uh, we do have one question from Marsha Fujimoto. She asks, Garrett, can you still speak pigeon? Yeah, um, there's some pigeon in here. Um, you know, it's it's hard to just leap into it though without someone else who can speak. So I don't well, know. I, I, we're, not, we're, not, we're not asking you to speak pigeon, but if, 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 if yes is the answer, that's the answer. <laughs> yes, I wrote to say bar and grill in pigeon, you know, in pigeon English. Half of the cast was supposedly GIs coming back from World War II. Um, Nisei GIs, and uh, I still had the ambition to try to write a, a whole play in, in Pigeon. Um, and then 
one of the poems in Pearl Road is in Pigeon. So yeah, I'm told though by our friends, Frank, Frank's friends and mine, who were in the cast of Nisei Bar and Grill, that my pigeon is kind of old. And I think it's the case because I learned to speak it from my father and grandfather, because uh, I didn't grow up as an adolescent in the islands. I grew up in Gardena. But the pigeon I spoke was the pigeon I learned from my father and grandfather. So naturally it would be old. It would be like their own parents pigeon as opposed to the kind they spoke growing up, um, you know, going to Roosevelt or McKinley or Iolani or wherever they went. Yes, it was, it was certainly fro frozen in time then. Well, I think um, those are all the questions we have, Garrett. I think I'll just uh, close with, with a um, typical dumb interviewer question, you know, um, uh, as a way for you to add anything that we missed, may have missed you earlier. Um, a book's called The Perfect Sound. And, you know, what to you defines the perfect sound? And have you found it yet? Are you still in search of, are you still in search of the lost chord? I'm good, you know, I'm good. I, I, uh, the book sort of put a lot of different things to rest. Um, it's hard to explain, but it, it was a kind of a fulfillment, you know, my father's wish to really create a great system that could play wonderful music. And I got that, but it also by getting that, I, I got to say there was a sentimental reason too, which is to say, to become my father's son, right? And I'm, uh, I am that, I really feel that. I, I don't know how many people have that as an ambition, but from when he died, that was the only thing I ever wanted. And I've gotten pieces of it here and there, but I think with this book, I'm okay. I kind of felt like I got his blessing. Wonderful. Well, it, it, it's, um, it's a great, a great read. Like I say, every page is loaded with the kind of um, tenderness and, and warmth that, that we've kind of heard from you today. So Perfect Sound uh, just arrived a few days ago at Elliott Bay Book Company and Seattle's Pioneer, I'm sorry, Pioneer Square. <laughs> <out there. laughs> Seattle's Capitol Hill neighborhood uh, is now on the shelves, in fact, right in front. If you want to go get it uh, tomorrow, uh, or you can order by mail through the link in the Zoom registration form, or I think Karen just dropped the link in there just now. Uh, and, you, and you can get a signed copy from Garrett if you order through, through Elliott Bay. So, uh, Garrett, great to see you. Thanks, buddy. Uh, thanks for spending this time with us here in Seattle. Well, thank you very much, Frank. Um... It's great to share so much with you, including uh, the Beach Boys. Thank you for going to the concert with me to see Brian Wilson at the uh, Montalvo Arts Center, whatever it was. Yeah, the, the winery, the, the mountain winery in Chicago. I couldn't believe you actually went to see Brian Wilson play his pet sounds in its entirety. But I, you, you went and you, you actually liked it. Didn't yeah, you? it was a great man. And we saw, um, we saw a remarkable concert. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Garrett. Uh, Rick, uh, Rick Simonson, back, back yes. to you. Yes. Thank you both so much. Um, woof, uh, the stories between you, Garrett, the, as Frank just said about the, the tenderness in here, the acknowledgement of all the people who've helped you or looked after you and in a way you were looking after them by keeping their stories going. And, and then the last part about your father, which was um, very moving and beautiful. Um, but why oh, you two could you could you have gone on and you could go on um and thanks frank also for all the other mentions which included a, something i didn't mention we do have signed book plate copies of of garrett's book and i think we're not too many places to do he's he's on this quick trip to the east coast and i suspect more will happen with time um and we'll see it's back to eugene but um this has been a preciously gorgeous wonderful night um i guess we have to find the buddha band's tape get that out of garrett's garage Frank, next time you go visit Garrett, that you know your uh, one of your assignments, yes. <laughs> um, and thanks, Karen, and everyone else. Karen has been part of this too, um, with the things in the chat, and all of you who put stories, um, and um, Michelle Oshima putting a lovely little note in here, um, hoping to find a large print version for her 98 year old Aunt May. Um, so, all these stories for everyone. Thank you again, um, Garrett. Good luck with Princeton. Um, 
and say hi to Ed Hirsch upstairs or downstairs, wherever he is from you, and in, there in Brooklyn, and good, safe, good and safe travels back to, to this coast. Um, thank you again to, yeah, thanks, Frank. We'll see you around, too, in the neighborhood. Rick. Capitol Hill, too, Frank. Yeah, <laughs> that was good. <laughs> well, we were back there. There were a lot of history and past here. Um, yes, thanks, Garrett. Beautifully done.